we've got Washington and Wall Street in the suicide pact. And as you said, these ballots just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And how, how, how big can it go, right? But they would rather stay in that cycle than try to fix it. And that's what makes it a crisis and not just one more, you know, financial hiccup. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Martinson of Peak Prosperity. And as you know, maybe from my recent coverage of David Rogers Webb's book, The Great Taking, um, I have confirmed that the typical brokerage account holder does not actually own their stocks and bonds, but rather has what's called a security entitlement and um, has also revealed, uh, as I dug around, that Wall Street's plumbing and piping is, well, it's very complex and it's quite difficult to unravel. Now, what if we could speak with someone who was there while that plumbing and plumbing and piping was being laid, who could tell us from a first-hand perspective what went on and maybe where some of the skeletons are buried and we want to talk about things such as sh naked shorting, things like that. Th these things sound complicated, but man, they're important. And today's guest is that expert, and we're very fortunate to have her on the program today. Suzanne Trimbath holds a PhD in economics from New York University, received her MBA in management from Golden Gate University, she started her career in financial services operations at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. And since 1989, Dr. Trimbeth, she's taught economics and finance in university graduate and undergraduate programs, is adjunct associate and full-time professor. Dr. Trimbeth authored, edited, and contributed chapters to lots of books, including Mergers and Efficiency back in 2002. Beyond Junk Bonds in 2003, Lessons Not Learned, 10 Steps to Financial Stability in 2015, and most recently, and something we're going to talk about today, Naked, Short, and Greedy, Wall Street's Failure to Deliver. That's a 2020 book. Um, Suzanne, welcome to the program. It is so good to have you here today. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Chris. Well, um, let, let's start at the beginning. Your, your career, you, you did work at something called the Depository Trust Corporation, when did you start and, and what is that organization? So I actually started in, in post-trade operations in San Francisco with the Pacific Clearing Corporation. And then, I, then within that same organization, they were part of the Pacific Stock Exchange. I also worked at the Pacific Depository Trust Company. Every yeah. certificate had to be endorsed with this uh, tricolor uh, signature plate. And an endorsement simply says that I am giving ownership of this security from myself. We were Pacific and Co. to CD and Co. So those nominee names that represent the companies. So uh, the the vice presidents from New York who had come out to um, they had brought a team of auditors with them to help count. We had to count all the certificates to make sure that. Everything that we had on our books was physically in the vault. And those, uh, before they left, uh, they asked me if I needed anything. And I said, yes, I need a job <laughs> because we were shutting down the Pacific Depository Trust Company. So they uh, uh, brought me out for an interview in New York and I was eventually hired as Director of Transportation Services for Depository Trust Company. And this was in 1987, so this was before Clearing and, uh, clearing and settlement merged. So, you know, in 1999, the DTC, Depository Trust Company, merged with NSCC, National Securities Clearing Corporation, to become DTCC, the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. I worked for DTC. I did clearing when I was in San Francisco, but in New York, I only, really my job was to, was, was on the settlement side. Um, those companies started as a result of problems associated with certificates. And when they tried to, so when I first started there, DTC, Depository Trust Company, had a piece of paper in their vault that said on it, and this was the you know, changes in the Uniform Commercial Code that came about later, like, you know, 94 or so, that it actually said, uh, this piece of paper is worth the number of shares that it says are on the transfer agents of books today. So it was kind of a, but it had, but they had to have, legally had to have that piece of paper there. So those changes to the Uniform Commercial Code that you talked about with me, 
especially mm -hmm. uh, uh, Article 8, that had to do with making it possible to represent real asset ownership in electronic form without having to have that piece of paper. So that was where that was where that uh, entitlements became an increasingly in, it, it became increasingly important for individual household investors who did not understand what was happening. But making that change was what enabled, made possible having these uh, electronic records for its poster trust company. Even when I was still there in the in the 90s, the municipal bonds, while well, the federal government had already stopped issuing certificates, the majority of the municipal bonds were already going certificateless, so they were electronic only. Just like now you have Treasury Direct where I can go in and buy shares, I can buy a bond, a Treasury bill note or bond without a broker, without a bank, just by directly from the government. And I'm on their records as a whole, as a, an owner, uh, rather than going through a bank or broker and ending up with a securities entitlement. Uh, so that, so those were, that was what really enabled and made possible for DTC to actually have the, um, you know, these, these programs for the electronic movement of shares and bonds. Well, the, the, the issue I have with, with the way the titles are, and by the way, to really get a, a clean understanding of this, I had to go through titles 11 and 12 as well as UCC 8, a little bit mm -hmm. of 9. Um, and so what came together was this idea that there's a Financial Stability Oversight Board now that if invoked because it feels that either a, a securities intermediary, some sort of a financial institution and or a bank above $250 billion in assets is involved and they decide... That, it, that it's a threat to financial stability, which I can't find a definition of anywhere. I'm, if you have one, let me know. Um, there if one. that gets invoked, there isn't one? No, there's not. Because <laughs> it seems That's important. Because they defined. say... The exact same oh. problem is happening in the EU right now. Uh, with uh, They keep talking about, you know, we reserve the right to do thus and such uh, if, you know, if the... Um, um, markets if it threatens financial stability but nowhere have they defined financial stability not neither no country that i know of and i've i've really only checked a few for that particular issue have defined what is financial stability but if they say financial stability has been invoked like a magic talisman right. Right. it says they get to skip whole chunks of bankruptcy code they get to do other things if they want um, and I found that interesting because to me, the bankruptcy code is probably four or five hundred years of very dense legal wrangling. And we've sort of worked out what works, what doesn't work. Now they're trying a whole new thing, which seems a little vague. I don't trust vague, especially in big, fast moving situations. <laughs> what are your thoughts there? Well, I think that, you know, that the other there's another uh, issue that comes up is this question of um, market maker. I've been unable to find a clear definition of a market maker. So anyone can actually make a market. There was a period in time where the market maker worked closely with the issuer to make a market in their shares. But now it, there's no one really checking to see, you know, who is and isn't a leg legitimate market maker. There, there is no definition that I've come across, and I've been looking at um, you know, financial markets since... I mean, for, for, you know, even when I was working at the Fed, I was an editor in economic research, and I read a lot about financial markets and, and financial stability at that time. And I've never seen a description other than if you look at the Federal Reserve talks about monetary policy having to do with um, inflation and unemployment, those, you know, those two statistics. But they don't really talk, that doesn't really get you towards this whole kind of funny money part of what Wall Street is doing uh, with, you know, issuing more paper than there are assets. And to imagine that you would allow more paper, more shares to be issued than there were actually assets underlying them, that that somehow contributes to financial stability, to me is absurd. It, 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 I, I can't even I can't even wrap my head around and say, oh, this is probably what they're thinking. I have no idea what that means to me. That those there 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 are they're polar opposites. 
either the assets are tied to the um, issuance and the trading and the sh number of shares in circulation, that's tied to the asset. Uh, and that's what gives you stable financial markets. If you don't, if as soon as you separate supply from price, then stability is, there's, it can't possibly be stable. It can't stay that way. It can't maintain itself. So when you say um, there are more assets than underlying, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about uh, just the derivatives that get layered on top of stuff? Are you saying physically there might be more shares of a company floating around in a market than have been issued by the company? Wh which are we talking about here? Well, both. Actually, both. Because the, um, there was this company called Market Group, which now is part of uh, DTCC. Uh, I have captured a, a, a shot of their website where somewhere in the 2007, 8, 9 period, their hallelujah moment came when they realized that they could issue credit default swaps all day long, regardless of the number of underlying assets. They were completely divorced. The two were divorced. It's the same thing when you have a market maker working with equity shares. So that market maker is allowed to sell shares all day long. As long as somebody wants to buy it, they can sell it. And what happens is that they, in fact, are taking money from investors and giving them nothing in return because they never receive those shares from the issuer. They never receive those shares from the sellers. So, so people just, so the market maker in particular is able to just sell shares without ever virtually ever having to deliver what it is that the investor has has paid for. I am shocked by that. You know, I'm old enough that I actually got some some like a few shares nominally from my grandfather back in the day and they oh, were nice. physical shares. You know, Bethlehem Steel was one I remember getting it that day. I was like nine or ten, it was like five shares. It was magic because it was a beautiful piece of paper embossed all yeah. that. But it had a Q SIP number on it. That yeah. that was an identifying number. How can you issue a share without a QCIP number? I'm I'm confused. Well, the, so the QCIP wasn't what made your five shares unique. The QCIP simply identified this as Bethlehem Steel. Uh, there was a certificate number, number, you know, B dash seven six five two, whatever it is. There was a certificate mm -hmm. number that was on the records for the that the issuer kept that said that this there is a certificate that was issued to Chris Martinson for five shares and, and he, he is the owner of these five shares. So that was that's the so it was a certificate number not the QCIP. The QCIP only identifies okay. the issuer and the issue. Right? So there's a code in the QCIP. The first um, the first I think six numbers six digits represent the issuer and then the next two rep tell you if it's a a stock a bond preferred common whatever it is and the last one is what we call a check digit and it's just a digit that is a mathematical combination of the the five numbers before it that says that yes that's that's a correct number it has nothing's been transposed so, so that's what um, the but, is. but but that id number you're saying that, that somehow people are issuing ownership without an ID number that, that, that chases back to any particular record. Right. It chases, in fact, it, there is no, <laughs> I know it's really hard to, to, it's really hard for people to wrap their head around this. It's like me trying to say, you know, how is it that issuing more shares than there are assets is a hallmark of financial stability? Like it just doesn't compute. Like I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm like zeros and ones are running in circles around my head. It doesn't compute. <laughs> so when I tell you yep. as a fact that there are more equity shares in circulation than the, than the, any issuer, let's say IBM, for example, there are more equity shares of IBM in circulation than IBM has issued an outstanding. And that's a fact. Okay. You go, yeah, so there, so there it is, it's not computing, it's like zero and one, I can't see, but I know this to be true, and I know that this is true of credit default swaps and all the derivatives. Of course, you also mentioned, uh, you know, getting kind of getting that point. It's true of mortgage bonds, mortgage backed securities, it's true of uh, municipal bonds, it's true of US Treasury bonds, it's true of common stock, preferred stock, etc. 
all of that is is subject to this sort of overselling, right? So they, they so the market makers are able to the brokers are able to oversell to sell more than they have, more than they could borrow, more than even exists in total sum. Well, that sounds a little bit fraudulent, but let me ask a, a very obvious question. So when it comes time to pay the dividend or the coupon, how does that get balanced out? Well, and this and that's 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 exactly the right question to ask. Like what happens when so I got it so I got a dividend because in fact I would try to explain this to a you know a, a state senator in New Jersey. And he says, Well, he said, I got my dividend. I got you know, I got to cash. I go, yeah, because you can they can borrow they can get cash from anywhere. They can get cash from the from the broker's own cash accounts, they can borrow it from the Federal Reserve, they can borrow it from a bank, they can get cash to give you cash. But what you're getting is not a dividend, you're getting a payment in lieu of dividends. Payment in lieu of dividends, PIL. So mm -hmm. uh, a, the, on the bond side in particular, the IRS clearly states that that is, that any interest in, uh, payment in lieu of interest that you get on, for example, a municipal bond, if it's, a, if it's interest, it's the federal government gives you a break on the taxes, but if it's a payment in lieu, no break on the taxes. So, so there's this whole, you know, there's this this whole, um, there's just this big hole. I describe it as a black hole. So when those trades go into NSCC and DTC, and they get matched and cleared and settled, there is always, there, there has never been a day when there were zero settlement fails. Right when everybody delivered everything that they sold. It hasn't happened in my lifetime. <laughs> Hopefully one day, it hasn't happened. So there's always these extra shares that just don't exist. And so if that happens on a dividend record date, then everybody who has, so the brokers come up with the money. So ask yourself, this is the next question is, how is it possible that the broker sold me shares of IBM and then and didn't have the shares so if they don't have the shares they're not getting money from ibm right the money's not going to dtc to go to the broker it's not they're not getting any money where how is it that they afford to give me money anyway so there's that's the motivation for why would you sell something that you can't deliver so somewhere there's profit in there enough to cover the dividends the splits, the whatevers, you know, whatever reorgs happen on, on these uh, equity side or bonds get called. For example, the broker has more bonds on their books for their uh, customers, households, institutions, whatever. They have more there than they have at DTC or at the transfer agent. But well, yet, if this one gets called, they're going to come up with thousands, like 5000 for you and 10000 for me or whatever it is. They're going to come up with that cash to give to you. How is it that they afford that and remain profitable? Well, if I sold you 100 shares of IBM at $100, I got $10,000 in my bank account. And if I have to pay you a 4% dividend yield, I have 25 years to work this out, I guess, or something like that, if I'm doing the math right. Exactly. I don't, it sounds like... It sounds like a check kiting scheme. It sounds like a Bernie Madoff, but just larger and and uh, and, and entrenched. I mean, if what and the definition of is entrenched, that's the key because all of this and this is where you know people's eyes start glazing over. I talk to the FBI, and all of a sudden, I can see them thinking about. I wonder if that happened to my four hundred one k. You know, <laughs> so that's where when I tell them, and this is all within those rules. This is all within the rules. Why? Because they are self-regulatory organizations. They wrote, wrote the rules to allow mm -hmm. themselves to do this to you, the investor. So uh, let, let's imagine that we have another sort of big liquidity hiccup in the market. This is 2008-9, which led to the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010, which I consider to be a, a little bit of an abomination, different story for a different day. But um, <laughs> if we get into one of these moments where people suddenly have to try and settle the books because, you know, margin calls are happening and, you know, all these things. So, so I, for the, for the average listener, let's imagine I'm one of these clearinghouses or something, and I've decided that I'm going to just sell 
10,000 shares or hand over 10,000 shares to this hedge fund because they want to short this company. I didn't actually have them, but they sold them. And that means somebody bought them. They think they own them. Those shares might have been loaned out again for shorting, which means another person or entity bought them. So you could easily see, I could easily imagine how a bunch of people would think they own uh -huh. a block of shares, right? Right. So right. If, if things go a little pear-shaped and you suddenly have to like settle that all out and these people all have to scramble for shares that aren't there, right. then what happens? Yeah, then that's where, um, that's where the brokers make sure to take care of their best customers first. So if you're an institutional investor, there was this guy that I had come to a, 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 an event that I put on in Los Angeles in, I think, 06. Um, and he, he was a, a money manager and he had an institutional account and he had a, like a money market fund account. He had a fund account and an institutional account. And he would put the exact same purchase orders into both sides. And the broker, his broker would call him on his institutional account and say, I'm sorry, we didn't get the shares that you think you bought, but they would never tell him on the other side. So the problem is that the people who are not, who are paying for shares and bonds that they're not getting are not being notified. And that's a oh. huge advantage to institutional investors because they have information that is not available to other investors. So what they do is, and I've seen some examples of this, what happens is they start with those, first of all, they start with the company. Um, uh, what's the um, RBS, you know, one of the one of the big banks or JP Morgan, yep. whatever, Fidelity, Amer Ameritrust, Amer Amera, or is it Ameriprise? I forget, Ameritrade. They, the first thing they do is they get all of the shares that they own registered in their own names, in their own company name, right? Not the nominee, but the company name for themselves. And then they go to their next big institutional investor and they get shares for that institutional investor and the next one and the next one. So by, that, by the time they get to mom and pop Martinson, there and there are no shares left, then they start doing the song and dance. You know, it's old, uh, you know, the soft, soft shoe shuffle and the hat and cane comes out and they start telling you, <laughs> oh, my dog ate your certificate and uh, the, oh, the transfer agent uh, made a mistake and they don't have any shares. The excuses they've made to me are astounding in their stupidity, but they will make an excuse as to why they can't get you the shares. And the reality is that they simply don't have them because they don't exist because they're, they have sold more shares and more bonds than the issuer ever put out in the world. That sounds profitable. Yes, it uh, it's, makes a lot of money. <laughs> and then, you know, then let's, and let's toss in a little MF Global. And all of a sudden, that money that you gave to Lehman Brothers to buy U.S. Treasury bonds for you and put to put in your account, you are now getting, they're paying you your 4% or whatever it is. And you're getting a U.S. Treasury AAA rating rate of return but you're actually taking Lehman Brothers or MF Global risk. And so your risk reward no longer matches up. You're taking massive mm -hmm. risk by leaving your shares or your bonds or whatever it is with this bank or broker, because if you have an entitlement instead of a share or a bond, your claim is against the broker. So you are entitled to X whatever number it says on your brokerage statement, shares or bonds from that broker, not from the company, not from the issuer. Your fate is no longer connected to, your financial fate is no longer connected to the company that you believed in enough that you went and bought shares of that company. Your financial future is now connected only to Merrill Lynch or Lehman Brothers or MF Global because there never were you were, you were never an owner. You were simply an entitlement holder. So as I understand the story, Suzanne, and thanks so much for explaining it so clearly, um, I, have, I have a set of entitlements held at one of these big brokerages you just, you just named. They have other deals and arrangements going on, right? They may or may not actually have the shares that have been sold to me or the bonds, okay? Mm -hmm. um, if they get in trouble, 
my reading of UCC 8, also the bankruptcy code plus 12, says that, hey, if a brokerage in particular is named out, if one of these gets in trouble, mm -hmm. um, there are actually senior claims, right? These belong to what are called qualified financial contracts. They're securities right. contracts. They also are derivatives things. So if turns out one of these brokerages has all these side bets going on with other financial, we'll call them institutions for now. Just, they call them persons in the language, but I, I know they're mm -hmm. not persons. <laughs> JP Morgan and things like that. They have these these other bets going on. And it says very clearly that if this brokerage gets in trouble, these people not only have seen your claim, but they say that the the trustee cannot avoid a transfer, meaning they can't prevent the siphoning of funds out of these things. It'd be like if I went down to the bank on Monday, FDIC has it receivership, everybody's lined up, they're locked out, but I get to go up to the ATM and take all my money out while it's in receivership. Mm -hmm. I found that rather shocking. Yeah, I'm not as familiar with the bankruptcy code as you seem to be uh, in, term, in terms of that, uh, who has a senior claims. I do know that equity holders in bankruptcy court are always at the bottom in the U.S. In France, they actually have a seat at bankruptcy table, but in the U.S. you only have that with bonds, not with equity. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you do, in fact, have CIPIC insurance, right? Um, and in like a case like MF Global, where they actually, there was, they could prove wrongdoing, that they were you taking customer funds and using it for other purposes, um, then, you know, then, then, you know, there are ways for, uh, you know, up to the civic limit. What is it? 500,000 now? I'm not yep. sure. Did they change that in 08? No, I know they changed lately. the FDIC, but... So, so you have, you have that civic insurance. And then even I remember with the FDIC insurance, in the last two bank failures, the big spectacular bank failures, the uh, Treasury stepped in, well, actually, the Federal Reserve, story for another day, stepped in and paid all the depositors because the FDIC didn't have enough money. Now, the FDIC is supposed to go to the Treasury, the way the rules are written. They're allowed to go to Treasury and say, hey, Treasury, I'm short a couple of hundred mil, you know, to cover this Silicon Valley Bank, so, you know, can you help me out? At the time that Silicon Valley Bank went under, the U.S. government was, had maxed out their budget. Remember the, you know, the, the debt ceiling, right? They couldn't read, they had to raise the debt ceiling and all that was going on at Treasury. So Treasury couldn't do anything. And they kind of off, you know, went off the reservation or went off the books and had the Federal Reserve Bank uh, back all of that up. So there's a lot of, once you get into the weeds, mm. like you are with the bankruptcy and new form commercial code, there's a lot more going on that sort of jumps over those rules, right? That they, that they, they do things that really, uh, you know, all the stuff that the, that the Fed and the Treasury did in 2008 was really against all of the rules that had been written before that. But they went ahead and did those things anyway. And a lot of that's covered in the naked, short, and greedy, but also lessons not learned. Um, so, they, so, so there are ways that you would, um, you would be able to recover up to the limit of CIPIC, whatever you know, the Treasury and Fed uh, decide to kick in. Um, if the broker goes into liquidation, anything their assets can be sold for. Um, but look, look at... For me, it's easier to look at examples of things that have actually happened as opposed to trying to, you know, plow through the, the, the rules because rule one refers to rule two, which refers to rule three, which refers to rule four. And by the time you get back to the original, you know, it's really hard to find exactly what you're looking for. But mm -hmm. let's look at the example of the um, shotgun marriages in 2008 between Bank of America claims that they, they felt forced to, to take on Merrill Lynch. Nobody wanted Lehman Brothers. So the government pick, was picking winners and losers. This one wins because I have a buy from you, lose because I can't get a buy for you. Ask yourself why no one wanted to buy Lehman. Why couldn't hmm. they find someone to buy at Lehman Brothers? They were the, they were the you know, the, the uh, blue shoes from way back. Like these were, you know, this is a, a venerable name on Wall Street. But they couldn't find a buyer for them. And in fact, uh, NSCC continued to carry a footnote in their financial statements about closing out the Lehman legacy account 
into like 2016, 2017 in their financials, in their financial statements. So why did it take that long if they actually had everything, if they had all the assets that they said they sold, why couldn't that just be closed? Too many derivatives? Too complicated? I think they, so Lehman Brothers in particular was pointed out by an article in the Village Voice called Wall Street Walker um, for, mm. uh, for selling mortgage-backed securities for which they had no mortgages, especially in Florida. And they took like Whoa, teachers. Say that again. <laughs> What? Yeah. Say that again more slowly. <laughs> selling, <laughs> selling MBS mortgage-backed securities for which there were no mortgages. With no M, it was just BS. Instead of being an MBS, <laughs> it was just a BS because there was no M. It was estimated that at one point by a bankruptcy judge that probably a third of the mortgage-backed securities in circulation in 2008 didn't have mortgages. The scale of that is astonishing to me. That must have been a trillion or more dollars of stuff. Trillions, plural, yeah. Trillions. Plural. Yeah, plural. The scale of that, that's so audacious. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, if, if I try and sell a used car that I don't have title to, I get in trouble, right? Right, right. So how do we know that they were selling uh, just the BS with, with, no, with no mortgage attached? No mortgages. Well, for example, um, the bondholder, the trustee for the bonds, would uh, try to take the homeowner <clears throat> to court <clears throat> in order to uh, uh, you know, exercise a lien against the property for the mortgage, right? In Florida, Ohio, California, and I think Nevada, um, the, in the bankruptcy court, the house was awarded to the homeowner because the bondholder, the bond trustee, could not prove a lien against the property. In other words, there was no mortgage for which that house was listed as the underlying asset. The homeowner walked away with the house and the bonds were told, see you later. So, so that's somebody the bought a example bond. of how we know this as a fact that this happened. Is that just a failure of due diligence on the bond buyer or is somebody like, you know, we had robo signing. There was some shenanigans going on. Like there's stuff going on. Yeah. There, I, what happened is, in, in my view, what happened was that the banks were so bank can make a bunch of home loans in, you know, I don't know Whittier, California, and then package those up and sell them off. Uh, and then they get cash, which they can then use to write more mortgages. So they were making so much money. So when a bank writes a mortgage, they get a fee for writing the mortgage. Somebody gets a fee for the escrow. Someone gets a fee for the um, uh, inspection. And so the, all these fees that go to the bank, plus the interest is paid on the mortgage. And then they get paid as the underwriter and the trustee to package those mortgages into a bond and then they get paid when they sell those bonds off to Wall Street. And they were just making so much money all along the way that at some point they just didn't care if they had a mortgage or not, as long as they had someone willing to buy the bond. Wow. Uh, and nobody really went to jail for that. That's astonishing. Um, yeah, 2008. No, not really. Yeah, I think they're, no, yeah. I, I, I just, they just didn't. They just didn't do that. I think that even the MF Global guys, I don't even think that they went to jail. Yeah. So, but and, you're right. But someone, they I mean, because they, oh. you know, that's one of the articles that I wrote it's called, you know, this perp walk needs handcuffs. And that was when all of the bankers were called to Congress to testify about what the heck happened in September of 2008. And it was like, you know, Jamie Dimon, you know, they were all, like, everybody was there, Dick Fall, they're all sitting there in the chair. So they walked up, that, that, those guys all should have been in handcuffs because they even admitted that they were selling securities that they had no idea how they worked or what they were or how they were ever going to get in or out of it. And the same thing with the Federal Reserve. Um, I put this question to Esther George, who was a voting member of the um, Federal Open Market Committee at the time. 
they bought so the so the Federal Reserve Bank bought up all of these BS with no mortgages. Mm -hmm. They knew it was junk when they were buying it. The banks knew it was junk when they sold it to them, and they gave all of that to the Federal Reserve. And I asked her, how are you ever going to get a bank to buy now buy that stuff? So the only way to move, move it off the Fed's balance sheet is to sell it back to the banks, right? I said, what bank is going to buy what they sold you knowing it was junk? And she said, we have no idea. It's never been done before, and we're just going to see how it goes. Well, so then they've been rolling off their MBS saying they're letting it mature out. But when it matures out, somebody has to pay them. If there's no mortgage attached to that, where does that money come from? Yeah, and that's and that's a good question. And that's a really good question. I just they just um, one of the things that happened at the time in uh, 08, 9, 10, that whole period, because I, I was right. I did a lot of current event writing and that's all in this this new book that you didn't mention, The Decade of Armageddon, it's this Wall Street Washington love story, you know, going on. Hmm. The Treasury and the Federal Reserve were not telling anyone. They were getting money from Congress, billions of dollars, in fact, it turns out trillions of dollars when they added it all together. And they were not telling Congress or anyone else who got the money and what did that party do with the money. So the, you know, Bloomberg, New York Times, Washington Post had to actually sue the Federal Reserve Bank and the Treasury to try to get information on it. And when it came out, it was horrendous. But honestly, at that point in time, uh, and I remember talking about this with um, uh, Matt Taibbi from Rolling Stone magazine, people just burned, the public burned out on listening to the stories about the financial crisis. They just, they just couldn't absorb any more information about it. And they just stopped listening. And that, unfortunately, is the point where all of the wrongdoing then just gets swept under the rug and recycled for the next time around because the public just doesn't take an interest in it. And one of the main reasons I do interviews like this with you and write books and articles and, you know, I'm on Twitter and coffee and Reddit, whatever, is to try to help people to, you know, find people who are interested in spending even 10, 15, 20 minutes on trying to understand some piece of this problem because it affects them. It affects their long-term financial health. And if they're unaware of that or that somehow, you know, brush aside, uh, then, they're, then they won't be able to take steps to protect themselves. Well, I'd be interested to hear what those steps are we can take, but in just a minute, because I have to, I, I just have to ask, <laughs> now that we're now that we're all the way here. Um, so there was this great financial crisis and there was a lot of shenanigans. And so maybe we learned our lessons. You say 10 lessons not learned. Right. Um, yeah. And and so my question, because you've got your new book, uh, the Armageddon book, which I did forget to mention. So it's important. What have. So we learned our did you say we haven't learned our lesson? I guess the question is, are things maybe more safe or less safe today than they were? in 2010 when Dodd-Frank got put in place? So Dodd-Frank was, you know, much ado about nothing. It just really called for, you know, do a study, write a report, and then make some rules. And they told that to FDIC, Federal Reserve, SEC, they told everybody, just go do a study, write a report, and make some new rules. Hmm. And some of which, by the way, the SEC is not yet finished. Oh, doing slow. what it was told to do in 2010 in Dodd Frank. They're still not finished. They still have a couple of open items. So, uh, in any event, or is it safer today than it was then? I'll tell you what I tell people who ask me about buying treasured bonds, you know, through Treasury Direct, for example. Is it safe? Because they're having a budget crisis and a debt ceiling, and should I worry about it? I said, if the U.S. government fails to the point where they are unable to meet their obligations in public debt, you will have bigger problems than your portfolio because those problems will be outside your window. It will be mm -hmm. the trash isn't picked up, the police aren't here, the houses burn, the fire department is in the show. Those are the, you're going to see those problems. At that point, your financial portfolio is irrelevant, right? So it's kind of the same way. It, 
the only way we got out 2008 was that the federal government stepped in and just paid for everything. And guess who gets to pay that back? So taxpayer, household investor, voter taxpayer, we're the ones that end up paying all that off. And that's so far the only solution that, uh, that any regulator in any country that I'm aware of has come up with, except for the few exceptions where the, the countries have gotten out ahead of it and said, you will not, you will go to prison if you make it short. You will go to prison if you violate these trading rules. Those, you know, they're, they're trying to get out ahead of it so they don't have to bail out their banks the way that we did. Yeah, this was uh, the term for this when I started reading about this 20, 25 years ago was privatized gain, socialized losses. Uh, it sounds like that's still the operative phrase here. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay, That's so exactly, let's talk about I was thinking exactly the same thing. Yeah, yeah it, I mean, it is heads they win, tails you lose, right? Uh, you know, yes, exactly. would you care to keep and, playing? And why we, you know, to me, I was astounded that all of the, like, after all of that happened, and, and there was one of those years where, like, the whole House of Representatives is up for reelection. Like, there's some sort of witching time when that happens. They're pretty much all most of them, you know, 90% of them, they all got reelected. Like 85% of them were reelected and 95% of the senators that were up for reelection got reelected. And we even put the same guy back in the White House. And so why did we do that? Like that was your chance to say, I don't like this. I don't like what mm -hmm. you're doing. I don't like the way this is being handled. But it's difficult for people to spend the time that you and I would to try to understand the ins and outs of all of this and the role that the government is playing because they, they have jobs, maybe two jobs. They have to take care of the car, take care of the house. They have to call the plumber, get the electrician. The kids have to go to soccer practice. They're going to the band practice. They're in, they're in the you know, football games. So people's lives are, are, are busy and they want to be able to you know, has some trust and some faith in, in the capital markets, this, uh, you know, this uh, Horatio Alger dream of being able to, well, that's actually kind of, I guess, the Gordon Gecko dream that you can just put, you know, gamble in the stock market and get rich quick versus, you know, being able to uh, build a prosperity for yourself. So if this system is, is as out of control as before, and maybe they've just learned even better how to do some of these things, and maybe they've even passed some rules that make it even more legal to do what just happened before. Um, <laughs> what are some things that people can do to protect themselves from this? Uh, I mean, uh, you're, you're making me think of that old aphorism down in Texas. They say, if you've spent 30 minutes at the card table and don't know who the sucker is, <laughs> it's you. <laughs> right, right. There was a, um, I did try to cover this in that kind of at the, the very last section of lessons not learned. I didn't want to end on this downer note, which now my nephew keeps asking me, when are you going to write a book with a happy ending? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so there is, um, in particular, there was a book called Loca Vesting. Have you heard of locavores? People who only mm -hmm. eat food that's made, you know, produced for them. I've heard of that. So there's Loca Vesting, right? And this the book is by Amy Cortez, C-O-R-T-E-S-E -E, in 2011. She goes into a lot of detail about things like your why doesn't your state set up a bank of its own to handle all of that cash flow? So when they issue a bond, they get all the cash at once to build roads and schools and prisons and whatever else it is they do. Well, they end up giving that cash to, you know, some out of state bank, for example, uh, to manage for them. Why don't they have a state owned bank, a state run bank or a state at least go back to that rule that says all of the assets that back up our state budget, capital expenditures, payrolls, etc., all has to be handled by someone in this state. They have to be domiciled in this state. You create jobs in that state. The interest is paid on the bonds, uh, creates an income stream. It builds, you can build roads and infrastructure with it. Why send all of that money to New York? And let J.P. Morgan, uh, you know, pay big fees to J.P. Morgan to handle it for you in New York when you're sitting in, you know, Phoenix, Arizona, or you know, Seattle, Washington. So, so that's one idea. 
uh, local vesting, she's got just a ton of information in there of how you can, you know, move consumer deposits from banks into savings and loans, right? That again, support the local community. And then um, the other thing that I say is I call it the, uh, you know, find your pitchfork moment. You've got to find this point where you just decide that you're not going to, you're not going to sit back and let all of this, you're just not going to let it continue. Um, I, I talk about, con so in my career, especially in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, I've spoken to, you know, FBI, Department of Justice, Securities and Exchange Commission, state banking commissions. I've talked to all of them and none of them have, will, will do the things that it takes to get to fix this. So I encourage people to look at themselves as not retail investors, but household investors, because household investors are voters. And if enough of them get together and tell the head of the Senate Banking Committee or the House Finance Committee, I want this to change. I don't want to pay for something that I'm not getting, right, from this banker broker. Then they can, because they do need to be reelected, and they count on you're not paying attention to the rules they're putting in place. The, the, the other thing is this direct registration. You talked about Treasury Direct. You don't have to, you don't need a bank or broker. You don't even have to go into the Federal Reserve Bank anymore. You can just go online and buy Treasury bill notes and bonds. Um, as a small investor or a household investor, you don't have the power to sort of set the rates. So you kind of take the rates that are set by the primary uh, dealers, but you can do that. And then the direct registration system allows you to buy shares in general um, you can buy shares directly from the company through their transfer agent. And if you have shares that are at Merrill Lynch or JP Morgan or Morgan Stanley, you, they can, because the, they're all members of Depository Trust Company. Depository Trust Company has a relationship with all the transfer agents. The stock exchanges have told all of the issuers listed there that they must have a transfer agent who is capable of handling direct registration. You can give an, an order to your broker who sends it to DTC, who sends it to the transfer agent, who sets up an account in your name with your shares that you own, they're no longer entitlements. So those are ways that people can have some assurance without having to rely on things like securities entitlements, which is, as you've found out, difficult to get your, hand, to get your hands around why it's like that. It, it's not just difficult. So far, it's proven impossible. I've gone all the way up through the legal department at certain brokerages. I'm trying to answer one question, which is, if I have these shares or these bonds with you, who has a senior claim on those particular items? And they can't answer it. And they may not, they may not actually know. They may be being invasive, evasive, possibly, but I think they actually don't know. Right? They wouldn't know until something erupted, and then they'd find out. Um, it's a weird thing. Yeah, no, you're right. It's uh, it's like when people, oh, I first started to tell people about direct registration, they'd say, well, I called customer service at my broker and they don't know anything about it. I'm like, yeah, if you, why would you go to, you know, the clerk at GameStop and ask him about, you know, offshore investments from, you know, GameStop corporate? Like, that's what you've just done. You've asked the wrong, you've asked the wrong person, you asked customer service for something that is a question for operations. So, they and and as you suggest, it's some of it, it uh, has to be intentional. Some of it is just that you have to teach that person their job. And their job is just open the account, make sure the names are spelled right, make sure the phone numbers are right, and that's all they really have been trained to do. They haven't been trained in these other these other ideas. But there's lots of information out there. So the, the direct registration was not born whole cloth in the form we have it today. The very first ones were employee stock ownership programs where companies would award a share or two or whatever to people who work there and encourage them to buy shares of the company you're working for. I don't know if it's a great idea because, you know, you, you're putting all of your, all of your uh, human capital and your, your financial capital in the same place, but here nor there. But it was set up that way. They didn't really, sometimes they issue certificates, sometimes they didn't. They would just keep records for you. 
Then there was a dividend reinvestment program, and that was where an individual could have, I could have a stock certificate or electronic, but even with a certificate, I could say, don't send me the dividend in cash, just buy me some more shares of the company and hold them for me on your records because nine times out of 10, it's less than a whole share. It's gonna be fractional shares. Um, and then from there we started, so the both the depository trust company and the banks and brokers did not wanna handle certificates because God forbid you lose one or you spoil it or you spill a drink on it or it's, you know, the FedEx truck catches on fire. <laughs> you can imagine the things that happen to physical certificates. Um, it, it becomes very difficult to replace it. So they were very much in favor all along the line of getting rid of certificates and setting up these electronic only accounts. We started with direct mail by agent where the broker told DTC, you know, Chris Martinson wants his five shares in his name, so set up the, send him a certificate. DTC would send that message to the transfer agent who would then directly mail you your certificate rather than sending it back to the chain. Why? Because neither DTC nor that broker wanted to handle that certificate one more time. It was expensive. It was time consuming. You know, probably, uh, I think at some point, maybe 50% of the people who worked at DTC handled physical paper certificates, right? Which now is, is virtually non-existent. Um, mm -hmm. So, so then it became direct mail by agent, and then eventually it came, it became direct registration, which says, you don't mail me a certificate. Are you the transfer agent that was appointed by the issuer, who, who a company whose shares I bought because I believe in them, has have have set you and selected you to be their transfer agent? You keep my re you keep a record of my ownership of that company of the shares in my name, and no longer with the broker and no longer with the depository. So uh, fascinating, um, Suzanne. It's uh, I'm going to ask the last question. You can evade it entirely if you want. But um, <laughs> when you look at the world today, uh, I'm looking at like a government that has two trillion dollars plus of deficit spending. I see a Federal Reserve that that printed doubled its balance sheet because COVID. Right. Um, it feels to me, and this is just one man's opinion, um, that that you know we had this little like we had this 1987 hiccup. You know, and, and so Greenspan wrote in with a put. And then 1994-5, we had a corporate bond hiccup, and they did the sweep accounts thing where they eliminated reserve requirements effectively. And then we had long-term capital management. Oh, that required a slightly bigger intervention. Then we had 2001, 2000, 2001. Oh, that required an even bigger intervention. Then we had the great housing crisis, an even bigger intervention. I'm, my lifetime is just bigger and bigger and bigger. I feel like I'm in a car that's mm -hmm. oversteering both directions, you know. <laughs> And and I'm wondering what you think. What's the next act in that particular drama I've just laid out? Yeah, I don't I don't see it. I don't see this turning out well. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> um, you know, it's we're all sort of stuck with it at some point, because if you have any sort of retirement pension that's not self-directed, you know, you're kind of in there. Like you kind, of, you know, you're you're kind of in the mix, and you're relying on the government to bail them out uh, at some point. Um, but it is not sustainable. It is an unsustainable process, whereby you are allowed to sell securities that are not represented by any underlying asset. This is a blue. This is why they wrote blue sky laws in twenty after twenty nine. You can't just issue shares that have no assets. You can't sell that to people. It was a dot-com bust all over again, right? Where yep. it's, you're just sell, 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 share, 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 shares. You know, give me, give me, give me the money. And then, oh, sorry, there's nothing left. We're going out of business. It, it's, it's unfortunate. I think that, I think that the EU is ahead of us on this because they mm -hmm. at least are talking about the fact that household investors are voters. And if you want to stay in the EU Parliament, you better tell ESMA, the regulator, that they've got to pay attention. Whatever they do, they have to pay attention to the impact it's going to have on the household investors. Same thing in Korea. They know that those household investors, and there's numbers-wise, there's more of us than there are, you know, of inside players, although they may have more, more money involved than we do individually, but there's more of us than them, and eventually it comes down to you know, politicians want to get reelected and they need to they need to pay attention to this and to start fixing this 
so that we don't end up at a point where we just have to turn around and bail everything out again. There is a point where, you know, that uh, borrowing power is just not going to be there. So far, we've been very fortunate. I have yet to see one treasury offering that was that they had trouble selling all of it. They are generally oversubscribed. So in other words, the treasury says, we're going to sell, we're going to sell 10 million five-year notes tomorrow or next week. And they get bids in from the primary dealers. And they tend to get at least 50% more offers than they have bonds to sell. So if it's $10 billion worth of bonds, they get offers to sell $15 billion worth of bonds. Of course, the Treasury doesn't. They only sell what they're authorized to. But there, and sometimes it's, it's multiples. The offers that they get are for twice as many as they try to sell. So our, our borrowing power, and yes, we have to pay for it. You know, every time our credit rating goes down, they increase the interest rates that we have to pay, and that increases our tax, you know, burden, et cetera. But, um, but, they, but we're lucky so far that that has not come to the point where the, the capital markets have said, I'm sorry, USA, like we're just done with this. We're, you know, we're not gonna lend you any more money. The, the, as long as that's there, then whatever happens and however horrible it is and however many people are hurt by it, you know, money will flow, will continue to flow. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's mostly a bad thing. I mean, I'm glad that they do it because then not as many people hurt, but there are still a lot of people that get hurt when these, when these crashes come along. A lot of people in a lot of ways and sometimes in unexpected ways. Well, if one of these crashes comes along, the story that, that I've just heard today is that um, the, it's not really a, um, a numbers game where we just have to find out what the equation settles out to. It sounds like a legal scramble and it's a little vague. You know, and legal things are expensive and they take time, um, right. you know, it takes a long time to unravel that. So I, I know that, um, yeah, anytime I've heard, like you, I think you and I talked on the phone about General Ray and, and Warren Buffett and he thought, well, I've just got this derivative mess, but I'll take care of that. It took him a yeah. lot longer and took a lot more money than he was anticipating right. to right, exactly. clear that out. And he's a smart guy. I assume he did some due diligence on that, but held his nose and dove in and. It was kind of painful. Held his nose and dove in, yeah, because he also, remember, he had a lot of money in Goldman. And so he had a lot of reasons to try to, to, try to go ahead and step in there. And or he had a lot of people buzzing in his ear. Don't worry about it because Goldman's in this and, and the government won't let Goldman fail. So whatever swaps you have, there, somebody's going to make good on it. And the federal government paid off all those credit default swaps that were that were just junk. They paid paid it off trillions of dollars to, and not just to. And this is another place where they went beyond what the law allows them. Because you say it's a legal problem, and 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 I agree with you 100% on that. They went beyond what they were what Treasury and Federal Reserve were allowed to do by by lending money to non-financial institutions. Right. So they were making whole Harley mm. Davidson. They were making whole, you know, Sanofi in France. They were making whole foreign companies and foreign countries on the backs of U.S. taxpayers. Ouch. Under the under the umbrella that says if we don't bail them out, the whole world falls apart and there's no world to wake up to tomorrow. That's exactly mm -hmm. what um, uh, Hank Paulson told Congress. If you don't, if you don't just give me all this money and don't ask me what I'm going to do with it, there won't be a tomorrow to wake up to. I and wonder Congress if that was the most expensive memo in, in U.S. government history <laughs> so far. Was that a page and a half? Cost us three quarters of a trillion right out of the gate? So far. The tarp? So far. Actually, in the end, the total, I think, was, I think I stopped counting at 23 trillion. It was, it was a lot more than you think it was. Yeah, it was. What? It was. A, it wasn't just the seven hundred billion at the, from the first bailout, because then they opened up all of these main lane LLCs and the um, you know the the lending facilities and all this other stuff and started buying up bonds that that they knew didn't have mortgages that they knew were just junk. So it turned out to be quite a bit quite a bit more expensive than the seven hundred billion that we generally talk about because that was the first bill that was passed by Congress. 
Oh, so that explains why those audit the feds never go anywhere, because that sounds like that could get a little messy. Right, right. Yeah, it, 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 and it wasn't just the Fed. Also, remember, it was Treasury. Mm. Because both Paulson and Geithner came from Goldman to Washington. Yeah. Right. And then Geithner now works with a, a, an equity, a private equity firm, a global private equity firm, so that he, you know, the, the lawyers leave the SEC and they go work for law firms that defend against SEC claims. So that revolving door just makes it increasingly difficult to, you know, it's, it's like, it's like why, why, if I'm a broker and I bought some shares from you and you don't deliver them to me, you fail to deliver, why don't I force you to buy them in the open market and get them for me? Why? Because the next time I fail to deliver to you, I don't want you to try to buy me in. Because that might, not, that might be to my disadvantage. So it's kind of the same thing with the Washington Wall Street love affair. You know, being able to go from Wall Street to Washington and back out again is a, is a real money maker for these people. And I, that's, I think, one of the primary reasons that it's so difficult to try to get real changes made. We're, we're in this regulatory crisis. This is not, you know, you can take any one piece of this, any one event, any one stock ticker, any one uh, rule that's being broken, and those are hangnails on the arm of this regulatory crisis, an arm that probably by now needs a shoulder replacement, at least a shoulder replacement, maybe like a whole carpal tunnel thing, clean out. But the regulatory crisis is really the thing where we've got Washington and Wall Street in the suicide pact. And as you said, these ballots just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And how, how, how big can it go, right? But they would rather stay in that cycle then try to fix it. And that's what makes it a crisis and not just one more you know, financial hiccup. Well, I think people need to know about this because you may not know this, but my other big branch of inquiry is looking into all things COVID and COVID related and the CDC and the FDA. And there too, I can throw those under this umbrella of saying they are under a vast regulatory crisis. They've been captured by the industry and, and the things that they promote might as well just be sales brochures for industry. Um, they have nothing to do with actual outcomes or what's best sure for population. Just, it, it's, so in my, in my, when I look at that and listen to you say that, Chris, you say you're looking into COVID. To me, that's like you, you're telling me, oh, I'm just looking into MMTLP. I'm just looking into mm -hmm. GME. Because the entire um, uh, uh, health industry has got these revolving doors. That's uh, Gretchen Morganson did the book called These Are the Plunderers. And there's chapter mm -hmm. after chapter, example of a, after example of private equity buying nursing homes, buying hospitals. And all of a sudden, doctors aren't able to provide care anymore, right? So it's not mm -hmm. just like COVID is like one ticker and yeah, there's problems there. But that whole healthcare industry is, you know, again, tied up in this this uh, love affair with Washington. Mm, and it's, mm -hmm. it's all about the Benjamins, it turns out, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's the Make cabbage in the story. Cost. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a fairly immoral, amoral corrupt system, I guess, is, is really mm -hmm. sort of the, the synthesis of that. So um, I know I've kept you beyond our allotted yeah, time. Thank I, you so much. I this was is just going to say, we're kind of gone past the. <laughs> yes, but own... thank you so much. This has been Fabulous. I'm, I'm really, I'm so excited. Thank you. Um, so please tell people where they can uh, find your writings and also where they can find your incredible books, please. Uh, so the, the three books of interest to your audience will be at Spiramus Press. That's S-P-I-R-A-M-U-S, Spiramus.com. They've published the last three books. It's a small independent publishing firm in London. As you can imagine, uh, it's hard to get U.S. publishers to publish books that don't say good things about U.S. banks and government because they're the ones who are publishing the memoirs of everybody who goes through the revolving door. Um, so uh, so Spiramus.com, Spiramus Press, they have those last three books. Um, you can, and one advantage of having kind of a strange name, Suzanne Trimbath, 
like S instead of Z, like it's S-U-S, not S-U-Z, and Trimbath is actually kind of a made-up name from Ellis Island, that if you just Google my name, you're pretty much going to get me. There's, I found so far one other Suzanne Trimbath who has a PhD in chemistry. And other than that, this, uh, the name is unique enough. So if I was you know, Jane Doe or something, I'm sure it'd be a lot harder. Um, I am on Twitter under my own name. I'm also on uh, Coffee. That's ko-fi.com. I have a blog there uh, under my own name, Suzanne Trimbath. And then I'm on Reddit now as uh, Dr. Trimbath, Dr. Trimbath. So those are places that people can go to. Um, I don't have pay. Nothing is paywalled. Uh, the books, of course, are, are for sale. Um, but the blogs and other things that I do are not paywalled. Um, Coffee.com, you, you can voluntarily, it's like, you know, pay what you will or pay what you think it's mm -hmm. worth kind of thing. So people sometimes, you know, send me something every month or, you know, make a one time, uh, uh, you know, buy me a cup of coffee one time. And that's fine because, you know, I've, I'm into, I'm moving into retirement and I'm not using this just simply as my uh, sole source of income anymore. But that's pretty much where I am. Like I said, I'm, you know, my, uh, there was a, a producer uh, for a, a film, a documentary called Stock Shock that I was in. And she said that I'm Googleicious. So you can put my name in the Google search box and, and up I'll come. So I'm um, pretty easy to find that way. Well, Stock Shock, good name for that. Cause you said some shocking things here today. Dr. Trimbath, Suzanne, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate this, as I know my listeners do as well. 